So yeah, as uh, he was saying, I am Joe Johnston from a design agency called Universal Mind, which is here in Grand Rapids. Um, we're headquartered at Denver, Colorado, so this is the interesting thing. Not many people that do know Universal Mind know that we're actually headquartered out of Denver, Colorado. We have an office there, roughly about 40 people, and in our office here in Grand Rapids, there's about 40 of us, right above Sanchez. So if you ever stop by uh, in that area, right across the hallway from the Co factory, so if you ever in one of those events, peer in a little glass window, you'll see a bunch of people in there, just wave hello. Uh, we're a bunch of nice people, so you can come in and say hello to us too. Um, there's about 160 of us. That's the other thing people don't quite know is we're a lot bigger than probably people realize. We have what's called a distributed network of individuals that work all over the United States and in Canada even. Um, I'm not going to discount the ones from Canada, but you know. Uh, the, uh, a lot of those are developers as well as user experience designers, digital strategists, project managers, um, and even some of our executives work out of their home. So we're more of a unique um, distributed model that people are trying to get to, and we've been doing it since roughly about 2003. So here in the office in Grand Rapids, we're primarily user experience designers, some digital strategists, some project managers, uh, but we get to do a lot of fun uh, interactive projects. We do have some local clients here. You may know some of them, Meyer, Gordon Food Service, work with them here as well as some of the furniture in, uh, individuals, but we also get a chance to work with uh, national companies, international companies as well, so FedEx, T-Mobile, Verizon, um, even some um, DNA sequencing companies called Complete Genomics. So um, very interesting uh, applications across the board, both enterprise and consumer. And we did uh, some work with uh, our friends at Sony before the hack. Um, <laughs> that was uh, the Jimi Hendrix experience. So that was a fun six months of my life. So if you want to know any information about Jimi Hendrix or Janie, for instance, got a chance to meet her, it was great. But uh, I digress, we'll get into the presentation here. So today I'm going to talk about design for sensors, not screens. And some people may take that too literal than others, but we talk about user experience, we're focused on that user experience side of things. So design for sensors, not screens, primarily around you know the sensor as, as, as if you are your own sensor, right? From the standpoint of I am giving out context as well as all these great you know, mini computers we have in our pockets and in our cars nowadays. But I wanna take a step back. Um, our friends at Forrester and Gardner have all said, you know, 2014, even 2013, even this year, 2015, they're kind of saying this is the year of the customer. Everybody talks about, and probably heard of, when you guys are working on applications. It's all about our customer experience, right? You're trying to create a better customer experience, which is true. Um, but I think they, they started to pinpoint that a little bit too narrow when they started to talk about that, as well as this idea of mobile first strategy. I'm sure you probably have seen this pop up, you know, several years in, in the past, as well as more and more large enterprises starting to move forward with a mobile first strategy. Well, that's good, and I, I think it needed a name to something, but I think it may have been a little bit you know, nearsighted as well. So how I like to take that mobile first strategy and twist it a little bit and say it's context first, especially as we start talking about sensors. We have so many things that we come in contact today that give us information as well as now we can give back information with you know, things we wear on our wrist and different types of devices that we can project our health and project our location. So now we can start building a con context aware experience around that. So whenever anybody says mobile first strategy, make sure you say, oh, we should probably rethink this, think of it a little bit bigger from a context first so it isn't so pointed as a mobile first strategy. So I like to coin 2015 as the year of the experience. One that I don't deliberately put customer in front of it and I don't in, in, in put the word employee in front of it either because it means both. I think we're coming to the year now that we finally have started to create these great customer experiences with all these you know, native applications that we can build for all these devices, both inside of, you know, from cars to inside of even on refrigerators. Now we can build these experiences for the employees. So the, the fact that we can create these very dynamic employee experiences are gonna affect all those great customer experiences. So now enterprises are starting to balance that out. A lot of times the employee experience tends to be at the bottom of the priority list. So um, I'm, I'm coining this year the year of the experience. And to go into that a little bit more, how many people have been to Disney World or Disneyland in the last year or two. You probably have went through this great experience that they created two years in the making, the Disney Magic Band. So that's this, that's this device right there, which is just uh, an RFID NFC band that they created, a wearable uh, band that you wear to replace everything you needed to do in the park. So anything from scanning your door locks to paying for food doing the fast passes. If you've ever been to Disney, fast pass is the thing to do. Even all the way down to everything you could actually do at the park can be used with that band. So no, no longer do you have to take that wallet with you and go on those water rides and destroy your, all your stuff. 
even down to the point now, Disney is starting to expand this program across all of the Disney parks and themes. So now when you go on the boats and the cruises, when you go to different Disney theme parks across the world, they're expanding that. And just to give you context, it took two years and a billion dollars to build this platform. So it was a very extensive, obviously Disney, they make quite a bit of money, they're not hurting, but a billion dollars for a company that probably makes hundreds of billions of dollars is still quite an investment. So there's a great article on FastCo that I can tweet out after this um, that talks about the front end design of this particular experience, which is all great when you actually attend the park and you get a chance to use it. But there's also what's called the digital transformation article, which is the what really happened. So uh, a company, Frog Design, if you have heard of those, they actually worked with the Imagineers. And there was a huge battle between them. The Imagineers said, oh, this is Disney World. You can't put technology in Fairyland. We live in Fairyland. You can't have technology here. So they even to the point where the um, Imagineers, when they were testing out devices that Frog would create, they would try to cover them up going through the rise to try to make them not work. So it was a great digital transformation article that talks about the real world battles that happen with projects like this. But what I wanted to talk about is this, this particular picture here. It, this is actually the BR Guest. Um, I don't know if you had a chance if this was open yet. When I went, it wasn't open yet. But this is the BR Guest um, dinner that is directly built around the wearable device. So what happens is you can actually, you know, set up your entire um, trip to Disney World. The Be Our Guest is a restaurant. You can select the food that you want there and you set up a particular time to show up. You don't really get seated there. You can just walk in, sit down. This NFC device has a sensor in the table that then broadcasts who you are, all the individuals and your names and information, what you want to eat, goes back, sends the platform uh, probably a, a wearable device or a tablet device for the employees to come out and now they can serve you the food and talk to you by name, but you never met that person before. A little creepy, right? But yet it's a very great experience. It's like as if they knew who I was. So that, that tied experience is what is starting to see, you know, obviously they live in the walled garden of Disney so they can get away with all of this great technology. But we're starting to realize that people want that experience. So how can companies start creating those? And that gets into this whole idea, and you probably may have heard this term, maybe termed a little bit differently, but it's the friction-free or what's called frictionless experience. So it's a, basically what that means is, is a way to take these sensors like that wearable device and that be our guest experience and not really have anything in between. The technology can then take the data from the individual, pass it on to the employee, and now you have this great, like I coined earlier, now if you have a great employee experience, now you have that great customer experience, so they're tied in the same. So these great friction-free, frictionless experiences is really going to be what we're starting to see as more and more of these enterprises and large organizations start to utilize all these tremendous sensors they're going to have availability to do. So the challenge, though, to create these frictionless, friction-free experiences, there's a, obviously, you probably heard of the Goldilocks principle. It's kind of why Earth is here, right? We're in the right place, right time, all that fun stuff. Well, that's the same thing goes for experiences. It's a lot of work that goes into trying to get your experience right there. So it's that just right experience for that just right time. So to do that, that's where you start figuring out how when you run projects, you do all that great user research, you do the testing, you do the prototyping, you validate, you come back, you reiterate. You, there's a lot of different work that goes into that. So this just gives a perspective of kind of where we want to sit on that arc and stream of that um, frictionless experience. So as we can say, is, is the interesting thing when we start talking about all these different devices and all these different wearable, you know, obviously this big coin was with the Apple Watch, right? Is it going to replace my phone? Is it, what is it going to do, right? So as people started to use it, but the big thing was it was all about, it was all about the fact that, you know, to create the best experience is actually starting to understand how to strip away that feature and functionality. Too many times, I'm sure you're in meetings, it's like, okay, what features are we going to add? What features are we going to add? Turns into that, you know, that feature is for our Frankenstein application that has all these different kind of features plopped on. So we really rhyme or reason to have those. So it's all about when you get into those meetings, starting to understand what can we take away from that experience that may could be offset by you know, maybe the location on your phone, maybe by the context of what they're trying to do, maybe the, you know, different types of sensors you can utilize inside of your experience if that happens to be the case. So you can start to remove some of that, you know, tons of different features that are added there and replace those with different types of context aware sensors and devices. So throughout this presentation, I have some stats in here that we'll kind of pinpoint and talk about a little bit. 
Um, so 221 times a day, and this is, um, I'm not sure if anybody has actually tried to record the number of times they looked at their phone. I know I'm way over that number. <laughs> I don't know how many, how many people would be over that number as well. But that's the average smartphone user looks at their phone 221 times a day. It's a lot. And I, the number that I would really love to know is what's the duration of time of those 221 times? Obviously, I would love to know the average. Is that a second? Is that two minutes? Is that four minutes? And that brings an interesting talk around you know, the smart watches that we're starting to see with the Androids and the Pebbles and you know, the Apple Watches. You know, that they've specifically tried to target some of these 221 times. Granted, we can offset that now with a glance on our watch to see if we want to take care of it, but reduce the amount of time on our phone. If you guys start wearing smart watches, or I don't know if anybody here has one or an Android or Pebble, whatever, the interesting thing you start to have a dynamic of is not only the, you know, the, the convenience of the notifications, but you actually use your phone just as much, but you don't use it as long anymore because you're, you can actually focus those you know, moments that you're working on something, you can quickly glance, check it out what it was, and you're not on your phone. The interesting thing is you used to pull out your phone, you check the notification, then what do you do? Oh, you go through this, you go through the next thing, you're going to Facebook, going to Instagram, all of a sudden you're sucked into your phone and you can't take away your focus. So I think that's an interesting dynamic we're starting to see as these smartwatches start to kind of invade us a little bit more and more. It's a de delicate balance. People are still trying to understand exactly how people are gonna use them. It's gonna be interesting to see if that number changes at all, if it goes up, but what's the duration of time they're gonna be kind of using. So I'm gonna get into some sections here, and this one's around the invisible interface. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of articles around what this is and what it's gonna be like in the future. Uh, but this one kind of puts it into perspective with a particular car app that some of you may have seen or experienced. But obviously the idea of the interv invisible interface is to remove the screens in front of you so you can have a you know, frictionless experience, right? So you're starting to utilize sensors and environment and context around you to serve up that experience. So there was this great app that came out for the iPhone and Android as well. It's a BMW app to replace you know, the key fob in your car. This would be a good one for you. Um, <laughs> so it was all, it was marketed as, hey, you know, it, it unlocks the car door, starts the AC, um, and it can do much, much more. But if you break down the steps needed to actually unlock your car, so really all you want to do, let's say the, um, the use case is I want to unlock my car using my phone or just unlock my car in general. What are the steps? Well, they broke down all the steps and you probably can tell the number of steps based on how small the first one is. So you walk up to your car, you pull the phone out of your pocket, and then you turn on your phone, and then you unlock your phone, because all of us have to unlock it, even using the thumbprint or slide to unlock. Then you, you, you never leave off just on your home screen on your app, so you're actually in another app, so you double tap out of that. You may be in a folder, so then you get out of that. So you're now, now you search for the BMW app, which you're not really using it all the time, so you don't know what it really looks like. And then you get to actually tap on the, the, the unlock button on the app to unlock your door, then you wait, right? Because it's got to hit all the signals to make sure you're within vicinity of the car and find it. And then it finds the map, and then it loads the map. Then you wait some more. And then you actually find the unlock feature inside of the app, which probably isn't identified too well, as many apps probably don't do. And then you actually slide. I think there's a slide to unlock. So you actually do a gesture to unlock the car. And then you actually can physically unlock your car. So there's 13 steps right there to actually unlock your car. So in reality, what did you want to do? If you were to break the use case, you want to build the, the right way to do it is a driver approaches her car, she opens the car door. Now there shouldn't be any interference between me touching any piece of glass or anything. It should just automatically happen. So the idea is to avoid an interface and screen that you don't necessarily have to use. So when you start building these experiences, think about are there things here that we can, again, remove based on giving me context of what I have. Now, I'm sure there's a million and one use cases that come into play with a lot of these different things, if it works here, fallbacks. But if you start there, you can at least think bigger than just, hey, let's put a button on here to unlock the car. OK, that sounds great, but in context, but what about the use case of that entirety 13 steps to get there? So this is also another one. Sorry if I'm in your way here. Um, I'm not sure if Alibaba, you guys probably know what the whole thing is there. I'm not sure you guys seen his little keynote that he did, but he got up on stage and the way they actually purchase content was he actually shown, <laughs> shown a facial recognition, which obviously was selfie style is what they marketed it as, to actually purchase content. So it was authentication with your facial recognition. 
That seems kind of creepy, right? Because what are they doing with all the facial recognition? What are they doing with all the stuff? But think about it, my 11-year-old daughter, it's all she does wants to take selfies. So to her, that might be like, yeah, duh, that's like the smartest thing in the world. I can just use this to unlock all the stuff. And it's just me, so no one can you know, mimic my facial features and, and take advantage of it. And this leads us to this <clears throat> particular kind of statement is that no matter how often we're kind of creeped out by technology, like that be our guest, how do people know who I am, or this selfie kind of recognition, we're always you know, willing to accept it a little bit faster if it serves up the experience before we even know we need it. And to that point, I got some other stats around that as well, but the interesting stat here talking about um, voice inside of voice recognition and voice text-to-speech inside of the phone. One of the things that we tend to lack is the sensor in our phone is the ability to talk to it. We don't really use that as a design um, sensor at all. So here's some stats around, you know, 40% use it for location. Seems pretty relevant, right? A lot of us use it for location. 39 text-to-speech to do text messages. We're going to even find that probably go up even more because of smart watches and not having a keyboard to interact with them. It's like a car. That'll go up. Uh, to make a phone call, that'll probably go up as well. But the <laughs> interesting thing here is, as the people they interviewed, 23% said they use it while cooking. Why would, why would they do a voice to text or voice to communicate to their device to go find something while they're cooking? Well, obviously, yeah, they got their hands inside of whatever they're cooking, and they don't want to touch that screen, so they have to figure out a different way, an input method, to actually communicate with that device. So context, again, knowing that they're maybe cooking or wanting to cook, there's a lot of different types of you know, data there to support. Maybe there's a way to take advantage of something here that utilizes audio to capture some stuff because they don't want to use their hands. So think about the full context of how they're using it in, in, inside of the application. So I wanted to show like four interesting, um, and I mean, to me, one of the creepiest ones, um, kind of platforms and, and technology as well as experiences that we, we have. I want to start with the one that I think is probably the creepiest, and it's this one. You guys know what this one is? It's the Amazon Echo, you probably have heard of it, right? Um, personally, I, I, I mean, it's cool, but what it does, it, it sits there and it's like an ambient speaker tied to Amazon. So not only Amazon collect every single piece of information you're buying on Amazon and searching and looking, but now they can just listen ambiently to just about anything that you're saying in your house. So now you can start serving up content. So the great thing is they'll be able to capture information in the house as well as you can, it's an assistant, so you can tell it, hey, forget the name they use. I think you can actually name it your own. Alexa, yeah. You can actually tell it to do music and different, or purchase content or add it to your shopping list. But it's ambiently listening to what you're saying. Now, people say the phones are doing the same thing, which some are, some aren't, who knows. Um, but it's collecting all of that data now to start serving up what those Amazon ads are like, wow, this thing knows what I want before I want it, right? So that's how they're collecting that information. That's why that one creeps me out because your friends can come over, and if they know you have one, sit next to that thing and start rattling off all the weirdest stuff you can possibly think of. And who knows it'll show up in their mailbox the next day. So that one, that one to me is a little, little, little bit uh, scary out of all the technology things. This one here is motion savvy. This is kind of interesting. This is a case that goes around a tablet that actually translate gestures, sign language into text. So you can actually start teaching and communicating through um, sign language. So it's kind of a very interesting. Now we're doing motion gesture based. It's doing the recognition of the fingers uh, to actually do the same, similar to you know leap motion and other types of technologies, but they put it inside of a case. Um, and I think this will be interesting as we start seeing this, maybe this type of uh, uh, technology be integrated in just about anything from the, 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 the camera on our computers to just about anything which is coming. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys were at Start Garden. They're doing a whole health posture workout thing. I was at Start Garden the other night for uh, the TechCrunch meetup. They're actually building a whole platform to actually do this for healthcare and uh, uh, helping with people with injuries and such. It's kind of interesting. Um, quicker than typing. What's that? Quicker than typing. I don't think so, but you know, I think it's more of the understanding of what it is as well as I'm sure there's how do I learn how to do sign language. So I'm sure there's like, oh, do this move, and then it knows if you did it or not to translate the text, right? So probably not the best form of communication because you can just easily type if you're you know, hearing impaired. Um, so yeah, I think that's more of a learning apparatus than anything else. 
Um, so this one is, is pretty interesting. This, it's not really the, the picture doesn't represent it well, but it, the, this is one of the Mercedes vehicles that actually has a sensor in the gas pedal. So it's a hybrid vehicle, so it goes from gas to electric. Well, inside the sensor in the pedal, when, you're, when you, it detects when you're switching from electric to your gasoline, it'll actually tell you in the vibration of your pedal. So actually you're getting feedback while you're driving whether or not it's using the hybrid approach of the vehicle. So I think we'll start seeing a lot more of these. Um, so they're trying to obviously reduce when you're driving. You don't want to put, although there was an example that was this Navi system that actually was a hologram on top of your screen. So they went the reverse way of actually throwing more contact, contact on the screen, which for self-driving cars um, might be interesting. Which, it shouldn't be autonomous cars. It should be, what is it? Elon Musk likes to say they're um, autopilot, like, a, like an airplane. So obviously airplanes can pretty much fly themselves except for the landing and taking off the harder parts. That's what he akins to autonomous. They're not self-driving, they're more autopilot. Um, and then this one is the HoloLens. So you've probably seen all the marketing crap on this one. But the, uh, um, and I think it's pretty cool, but I think they're, they're overdoing the marketing because from what I've heard, it doesn't actually look like this. It's actually a, a small little, I don't know if anybody's tried one out or not, but um, it's a little more like a window inside here that you get the virtual reality. But this in itself, which I'll talk about a little bit more about virtual reality, um, as weird it is, as, as it is, or AR, VR, um, I think there's going to be tons of opportunity for this space. It's just a little bit ahead of its time, and I think people are going to find some really interesting ways to use that um, that I think will be really fascinating. So it's, you wear it, and it basically overlays you know, weird stuff like this. For, in this instance, it's kind of goofy. But you can see people love recipes and cooking, I can tell you that, and just all the examples. Um, it's really fascinating, but I'm not sure if it's totally there just yet. But the other point is, too, it's still a big, giant thing you wear in your head. And I know Google Glass, everyone thought it was really awkward and weird, which it was. I wore it. It was weird. But that thing's even bigger and weirder, so I don't know how that got away with it. But anyway, um, and that's, that's that. So I wanted to talk a little bit. Um, this gets into a little bit more of the kind of these new business models that are starting to be generated by all these sensors and different types of applications. Um, and I like to call them instant gratification economy. Some people call them crowd economies or other types of uh, names to them. But obviously, it's, it's, you know, obviously the first one that comes to mind is Uber, right? Is the great, you know, it's, I like to say they're not a taxi company. They are a logistics company. They just happen to deliver people right now. So mark my words, they're going to do a whole lot of hell of a lot more stuff than just people, which is going to be fascinating. But they're going to disrupt a lot of businesses. But anywhere from like this DoorDash, obviously food delivery is huge. Not here yet, but it will be um, slowly. Uh, but obviously New York, California, that's all people do is eat out so they have it delivered to the homes. Um, and then there's this uh, one one, which I think just got purchased, I think. Um, and obviously Amazon, with well, all their instant delivery services. But it's these, um, you know, instant gratification economies. I push a button, something happens, right? We're all used to that. Amazon, one click, you know, changed our lives, right? We hit a button, automatically something happened. Now Uber, I push a button on my phone and a taxi comes to me. It's that type of, uh, of system. But the interesting thing, why do you think all these services, I mean, they could have technically maybe have started a little bit sooner, but I think one of the things um, that happened was, oh, this is the Amazon, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So one of the things with Amazon um, was this idea of what we talked about earlier was uh, the focus on time to satisfaction, which was that, um, you know, take all this great data and serve up that experience before I even know I want it. Well, the interesting thing, Amazon has a, an anticipatory shipment patent, which you know, I did a little research on it. And not, I've actually saw a couple people actually starting to receive these. If anybody's an Amazon Prime member, <clears throat> what it is, it basically takes all of that huge data, like that Amazon Echo thing, and starts to collect it all. And it basically says, OK, we know you're going to order this. So we're just going to order it for you. And it's going to ship it to your house without you doing anything. So that part is a little creepy. It's starting to happen with certain people. I've seen it a couple of times. People are a little creeped out about stuff showing up. It's like, oh yeah, I needed this paper towel. I already ran. How did they know I needed that paper towel before I even knew knew I wanted it? You get creeped out, but it's, it's convenience, right? It's value and time to satisfaction. I'm okay with it. You forget that all the privacy stuff that's happening behind the scenes. So this one will be interesting to see how this starts to evolve into other things and how, see how people are actually okay with it. The big privacy question is going to be a huge one that we start designing for. How do we make sure people are comfortable with what they're doing? So. 
the idea was earlier around that whole Uber, why did Uber all of a sudden take off huge all over the place, right? Even here in small Grand Rapids, it's actually here, right? Well, you may think, well, it's because we have mobile, right? Everybody that wants a taxi can hit their phone and they're mobile. It is mobile, but it's not really that way. It's actually because all the workers now have the smartphones. So now they can just take the logistics of like, oh, we're going to go start Uber somewhere. What do we need? Oh, we just need workers to have the smartphones, ship the smartphones out, sign some paperwork, make sure we're legal, and then kind of. And then you take the fleet of cars you want, maybe start with UberX first because you use your own cars. But now you create a whole network because consumers can just download the app. But now you can give all your workers the phones, and now you can have this instant crowd-sourced, crowd-funded type of you know, economy driven by each other. I have workers that drive cars. I have people that want to deliver places. So it's this whole idea of having smartphones that employees now, and this gets back to that employee experience. Uber's app is great as an employee experience because the consumer is just as good as the employees. So it's an interesting model we're in here that it, now the employees have the smartphones just as much as the customers do. And that gets back to employee experience. So like I said earlier, there's a direct correlation between if you have a great employee experience, you will have a great customer experience, consumer experience on the other end. They happen in tandem. And I think people are just starting to realize if, hey, if I, how many times have you been on a call center phone and you wait, oh, hang on, I got to transfer you. Hang on, I got to transfer you. Hang on, I got to transfer you. Oh, whoops, you lost him. Now you got to get back on the phone again. It's horrible, right? Well, how much do you bet that person sitting in front of that screen has a bunch of crap all over the place? She doesn't know who to talk to this, or I don't know how to find that person. Employee directory is all screwed up. So that part of it is she's looking at a, a screen that's probably who knows how old, and that whole platform is probably screwed up. has seven different systems trying to talk to. It doesn't work very well. So at, you guys on our end of the phone and women have to deal with that particular experience. So I think you'll start to see employee experiences today start to equal out. Um, and some of us create those, which is going to be really interesting. So back to this Be Our Guest. The, the great thing is, is that they had you know, this great customer experience. You get to go there. You sit down. Food just coming, and then the people talk to you. It's like, hey, how's it going, Joe? Nice to meet you. Like, How do you know who I am? I've never seen you in my life. Oh, yeah. So they a little creep factor there, but it's definitely well worth it because you're having a great experience. The value is there. But the one thing that happened with the Magic Bands, and it's called Magic Plus. My Magic Plus is the whole platform. Magic Bands is just the band. It allowed employees, being Disney, right? They want to have the happiest place on earth. They want to have a great, always have a great experience there. Well, I removed that, hey, here's my ticket transaction type of experience into now much more of an interactive personal experience that I can give them, which Disney always wants. But now you can take this model and use it for your own business and companies. That's what we're going to start to have here is we're going to remove that transaction barrier of being on the phone, hey, hang on a minute. It's more of a personal transaction because we're going to be able to start to collect that contextual information and serve up that just right Goldilocks experience. That's what they're trying to do in Disney. People are trying to package that up and now take that outside the walls and create their own company, which is very difficult because now you have to deal with all of the logistics of everything, not just with inside of Disney. So wearables, though the fun stuff. So first, if, this is the Gardner hype cycle. Have you guys seen this before, maybe, on the web somewhere? So yeah, we're right there right now. We're probably gradually moving down a little bit, but I mean, this is probably about a year old. But obviously, there's very cool things in here. Some stuff, I have no idea what they are, but they sound pretty cool. The, so we're at the hype of you know, Internet of Things and wearables. Obviously, even consumer 3D printing is down farther than where it probably should. But it's just the fact that it's up there, and you know, we have everybody and their brother building something on Kickstarter that has to deal with some sort of wearable. I'll get into Internet of Things, too, in a second. It's, it's definitely going to be a, a long wave we're going to ride. And we're still yet to know exactly how you know, these things are going to work. I mean, if, if you've used one of these, and even the, I've had it for about a month now, and it's still interesting how it works in your daily life. You use it just like a watch, which people are like, oh, it should replace your phone. No, it doesn't. It's, it's a watch. Let it be a watch. So it, I think we'll, we'll see how that works. But this, there's a lot of different w classified as wearables, and I obviously don't have enough. An hour-long talk isn't nearly enough to talk about all of them. This is, uh, so I just pulled out some of the interesting ones, some we already talked about. This one here, have you guys seen this? It's, it's a Mayo, it's called. It's an armband. And the only reason I think it, it's kind of weird that you wear it up there. I actually have one. I was going to bring it, but battery's dead. That's the nuance of these things. You got to plug them in all the time. 
Google Glass, same thing, although that one only lasts 10 minutes. But the my armband actually detects the electrical impulses in your arm. So you move a gesture in your hand, it can map that, and you can control. So I could control this whole presentation, although I'd have to go like this all the time, which defeats it. Make. So some of these things are counterintuitive because you get fatigue. But the interesting thing is there's the idea of being able to listen to the electrical impulses in your arm. Imagine now that I have this watch and my hands are full and I want to reply to this message that just came in. I can actually do a gesture with my hand. If they say I want to do reply with one, it would know based on electrical impulses with the band to know to respond to one. So now I can actually control my watch using that. So there's, there's actually, a, I think, an Android Wear attachment that actually goes, I saw the video today, actually put it on your Android Wear watch and it actually detects electrical impulses. So you can actually can do gestures with your hand to control your watch. So a little weird, but I think the idea of capturing that, just like the facial selfie thing, is going to be something we're going to be OK with, just like this thing capturing all my health information right now, which is great, but also creepy. The, obviously, the Pebble, that's going to, the interesting thing with Pebble, if you guys don't know, it's still on Kickstarter. It hasn't came out yet, I don't think. Um, the band, which I'm surprised Apple hasn't jumped on board, though I think they probably will by the sounds of it. The bands are actually going to be sensors themselves. So you'll buy the Pebble watch. And then the bands, instead of just being like Apple and costing $600 just for the steel one, it's actually have a sensor in it. To, and you can actually, the linkages actually in the Pebble are going to have different types of sensors. So if you want a glucose monitor, you want a, you know, I don't know, different types of alcohol level, whatever you wanted in the bands, you can actually, instead of buying a whole new watch to do the sensor, the bands would have the sensor. So I think that's where you're going to go. The modularity of the bands are really going to be key. Granted, fashion too, but I think it's also going to be pretty interesting how the Pebble competes directly with Android Wear and the Apple Watch. And you know, Fitbit, which I'll get into in a second, this is the NIAM band. This actually detects your heart rate. And they're doing the same thing kind of the selfie was. The heart rate was to unlock your computer. So it detects your heart rate, just like your heart rate has a pattern, just like your fingerprint they say, that now you can actually walk up to your computer, unlock your computer, and start working. Although I think you can actually do it with some apps on the Apple Watch now, too, once they release the heart rate monitoring. This is the Misfit. Have you guys seen this? Um, this is actually a little disc tracker. It's only about that big. It's magnetic. There's a bunch of different ways you can wear it. It's almost like a fashion necklace to a little <laughs> wristband. And it tracks all of your um, steps. It doesn't do heart rate, but it kind of calculates this pedometer, it's basically, but it does track a lot of things. Um, the interesting thing, this whole thing is magnetic, right? So you have to sync it with your phone, but it's metal and it's magnetic, so Bluetooth range pretty much goes to nil. So the way, the way the app actually has to work, I had a video in here I used to for a presentation, you actually had to physically set it on the phone to actually do the syncing. They created a great UI for it, you actually drop it on, it looks like it's absorbing the data. It made it fun to watch, but they had to get around that whole you know, magnetic metal you know, feet to be able to sync with the phone. So interesting one there. Here's the Oculus Rift and the HoloLens, a little different Oculus Rift, um, similar, AR, VR, and then obviously the, the Apple Watch. The, um, have you guys seen the Google Cardboard at all? Probably heard of that. So that one right there, I don't have a picture of it. I just saw a video. So I don't know how I haven't seen it earlier. The SCAD program, the Savannah College of Art and Design, they actually sent out to all of their recruits that they were coming in to the program, they sent out Google Cardboard, branded Savannah or SCAD, and actually in, told them to download an either iPhone or Android app, slide their phone inside the Google Cardboard. It was actually a, a VR of their campus. So they actually could get them enticed to come to their school based on So I think you're going to start seeing these very interesting branded VR experiences with Google Cardboard being a cheap and expensive one of these, but then rely on the lenses and the, the apps to kind of do that. No won't be as in-depth as these, but you'll start to be able to have some pretty fun branded experiences that you can push out with apps. It's going to be very interesting. So based on the Fitbit, so anybody here have a Fitbit or a Fitbit Surge or used to have one? I should coin that with, did you have one? And now it's at home in your drawer, like six months, because that's like the window. So there's some stats around, you know, they say that 51, this is before the Apple Watch came out. So a lot of it's around, you know, the usability of the pedometer type of style. So it's about, hey, I want to change my habits, but I can't change my habit until I know what my habit is. Well, the problem with that is once you know what your habit is, you don't need to be told what it is anymore. Six months is the window. 
So 51%, you know, people reported, well, this is a privacy one, sorry. Privacy was the main concern around the wearable device. So a lot of people don't want to wear, you know, something attached to their body. Although I think Apple you know, flipped that coin because it's had so many, you know, intriguing sales at this point. But one third of Americans who owned, this was the own the wearable device, the Fitbit, for instance, or the Jawbone or a um, Nike fuel band, which doesn't exist anymore. They, don't, they got rid of it after the first six months they used it because it's that window of learning habits, changing habits. Yeah, I, I know when I don't hit my, my goals, so I'm going to be OK with that. And then you forget it one day, and then, oh, I don't need it anymore. So then it sits. But the interesting thing, hence why the fuel band isn't around, well, minus that Apple bought a lot of or acquired a lot of the fuel band um, employees, the half of the Americans, so if you put it in perspective, all those Fitbits, first gens, and Jawbones, that were out there, they're not even, half of them aren't even used anymore. So you can imagine the amount of, you know, uselessness that those have. And then when smartwatches came out, added a layer of a little bit more depth to those from an experience level, because now it's, it's a watch, but it's also starting to have more and more sensors to it. The notifications started to balance there. And obviously Pebble was first on the scene with a lot of those in, interactions. So, <laughs> That's all the downside of those wearables. So now what's the uptick? Now this gets into the, we always talk about wearables and even internet things to the point where it's consumer generated or consumers want to use them, us going to the store, buying them from Apple. And usually the enterprise and the employees usually are the second ones to come in the wave. And as probably well know, that's the much bigger wave when you got a lot more large companies building whole platforms to you know, target that misfit um, that misfit here, interesting story, there's an insurance company called Oscar Insurance. They actually give all of their members one of these and they wear them. They wear them and then they start tracking all of their health information. They give them premiums back based on how much they work out or how much they walk. So they're actually starting to use these to give benefits from a health perspective. As well as, you know, companies are going to start leveraging these wearable devices to give off benefits, just like the automatic or the but progressive insurance, little car thing you put in your car, drive good, you get your money back kind of thing. They're going to do the same thing but with our human bodies. So that's what's going to eventually going to happen. So back to the wearables from, you know, this is a sales, this is from Salesforce. So take these numbers with a grain of salt. <laughs> the, uh, so 79, so this is from a business perspective. So they interviewed, I think, a couple thousand people from a business perspective, asking them what they thought about wearables in the business world. So obviously, you know, they're from a, for a strategic standpoint, they do think they need a wearable from a strategic perspective. And they say that, you know, of the people that already have them, some of the people they interviewed didn't have them, 76% 76, 76 improve their performance, which makes sense, right, from a performance standpoint, depending on what the device was doing. Um, and then they're increasing the so 86% are going to spend more money, basically. They're going to spend a lot more money on what they need to do to encourage or to utilize the devices and the platforms. Here's another, this one's weird. I don't know why they drew it this way. But the, the real key here is obviously device integration. As we obviously build things that tap into tons of different APIs and services and all that fun stuff, that's even going to be more important is these device integrations. The, Next one down, loyalty and rewards programs. We're seeing more and more companies starting to leverage, just like I talked about the Oscar insurance, starting to leverage loyalty programs to take advantage of giving people money back by wearing these wearable devices from an employee and, and customer or a business perspective. Point of sale, obviously, the Apple Pay is, is kind of said a great way. But the interesting thing with Apple Pay, not only is it more convenient, if you've ever been to a, a Red Wings game or at Comerica Park, if everybody used one of those, how fast those lines would be, that's really the, the benefit of that is the speed by which you can pay. That's going to be huge. Uh, and then obviously some of these other location sensing technology, immersive experiences, that's where we get into that year of the experience. People want these experiences to build context around them, both employee and customer side of things. So I think you're going to see a, a huge amount of influx from the business side taking advantage of these wearable uh, devices as well as other types of devices as well. So IoT, Internet of Things. Again, another area where it's going to explode. And even this chart's a little bit old, because um, I'm sure this is probably even bigger now because of all the things that are starting to bubble up to the surface. But you can see, put it in perspective, what we just talked about wearables. I mean, this is where the, I mean, basically Internet of Things, anything that can be connected to the Internet 
or anything will, right? So anything from our toasters to our coolers to our, I mean, anything. It's, it's ridiculous. Again, with the Kickstarter, you can go in there and just find tons of very interesting Internet of Things connected devices. And even businesses like Whirlpool, which you think would be all over this before it blew up, are trying to figure out ways. And that's the problem with some of these larger organizations. Very difficult to move fast. And that's what you're going to find. That's why it's going to eventually grow. Have you guys heard of a site called Quarky? So there's Quarky is an Internet of Things, kind of like Kickstarter, but it actually has a whole group in New York City that actually will take your ideas. They'll select them. They'll go through a vetting process. If your idea gets selected, they'll actually do all the industrial engineering, the, all the back-end in engineering, and you basically can almost be like, this is my product. They sell it. They do all the stuff for you. So it's a great way just to peruse all these great um, Internet of Things ideas. They actually partnered with GE, so there's a lot of products that are tied to GE. But some interesting ones, this is a piggy bank that's, excuse me, the internet has an app. <laughs> it goes off if you flip it upside down to try to empty it, so it'll send notifications. So if you try to steal your kids' money, they'll get notified and stuff. But it actually keeps, it keeps um, the amount, so it knows what coin's going through the slot. So it actually can just rack up. So the kid can ask, how much money do I have? Unless, instead of dumping it out and counting them all, which is still should be done. It's fun. Um, but they just made a little pig out of it. Uh, and it makes noise and stuff. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, and obviously, you've got to have an egg carton that knows how many eggs you have, right? So the, all these little sensors tied to your phone, it knows you know, when the eggs are out because you're always at the store saying, oh, how many eggs do I have? Well, not all of us, but you know, it's a good idea, I guess. Um, now you have at least a dozen. Yeah, exactly. Um, the one that's probably the most interesting, it, obviously, there's people that have central air, and then there's a bunch of people that have window air conditioners, whether in their apartments or they just have multiple window air conditioners because they can't have central air. They decided to build their own um, window con air conditioner and then have it be connected to the local internet, Wi-Fi. And actually, it's almost like a Nest thermostat, except for it's an air conditioner. You can control it wherever you want throughout your house. You can have multiple. So it's a great way to have almost like central air or, or a Nest, but it's with this particular unit. And this is actually partnered with GE on this one. Uh, I think, I forget the guy if he was from New Jersey, but I think he had the idea and they worked with him on creating the whole, whole, prop, whole platform and program. Um, and then this one is actually created by one of our uh, employees at Universal Mind. This is actually a pool uh, chemical detector. So it's for larger pools or, or a consumer pool. You drop it in, or you, you sink it all together, you drop it in and there's a light on top, but it detects the amount of chlorine or imbalances pH levels. So instead of you dripping this in dripping and trying to figure out what it is, it'll actually collect it over time and just send you notifications when it's out of whack and tell you what to put in it. So that one's actually getting created now. So it's all, uh, got a little inside track from her. So she's been doing working on that on the side. So it's pretty fun. A bunch of pictures that went out there to, she went out to New York and got to do a bunch of fun stuff in their lab. It was pretty cool. So if you ever get an idea, go to Corky and see how that process works. And then obviously beacons, right? So I heard of iBeacons and just beacons in general. We have GLO here in town. They're doing a lot of stuff. These are Estimote and Gimbal and um, different types of uh, beacons. So it's a little low Bluetooth energy beacon. It's like a radio signal. Um, and it's for micro geolocation. So I don't know. It, the thing is, is, I don't know where that is in the world. But it, if I come within a proximity of it, I know that it exists. So it's if I know how close I am down to the uh, meter distance. So it's great for. You know, right now they're using it for a lot of, you know, these things, which is I think the worst thing to use it for. But uh, advertisements, pushing people advertisements, but more of context around what's around you and giving me information. Great that I know that I'm close to something, but do something more than send me a 20% discount on a hot dog or whatever it might be. Um, but I think there's some great installations of these types of. Micro geolocation is another part of the context you want to have information around, and you can build some great experiences around them. I don't know if you guys have been. There's the uh, Urban Institute of Art has a had a program not too long ago called the Disart Festival. So what it was was artists uh, were all disabled creating art pieces inside of the U UICA, as well as the they encouraged the amount of members to go. So obviously, art and museums are more than just about us as normal people, but anybody that can enjoy the art. So it was really focused around pushing it around disabilities. So they approached us, we approached them, had a great conversation. 
it's like the, it sounds like a great event happened to be started in the UK. It's the first time in the United States here. Um, they wanted an application to utilize. They really wanted an app first to kind of showcase the content. I go, well, we can put beacons in here to kind of offset that to give a little more micro geolocation for the artists and information. The great thing what we did here is this whole app was great because we don't get the chance to do this as a priority. It was all about accessibility. So how many apps have you built that have been focused just on accessibility? A lot of times like, oh, we got to make sure it's accessible, but not really the main focus. So the great thing is you can actually use Siri to drive this whole thing by, by voice and it's limited touch. So what we did with the beacons was we didn't really put an in-your-face type of experience. This is one way to offset that kind of push me a notification or change my experience. You'll see these little um, alpha out lines. That's actually the this art logo a little bit. But as I'm getting closer and closer to individuals, artists, this will actually glow darker or lighter. And also, if I'm say I'm in a wheelchair or I can't quite touch my maybe I don't have the motor control to touch my phone. Once you start it, you can actually roll through the entire experience. And there's a setting in there, it'll auto scroll. So if you don't touch it for 10 seconds, it'll actually auto scroll with the, you know, the least up the top. So your highest one's right in the middle. So you can get a good gauge of where you're at. So you have to touch the screen. So I actually used it in the aid of navigation a little bit. And then you can actually tap in to get more information about the artist. So walk around. So this is a way to aid, you know, using beacons in a sense where it was a little bit not as much in your face as what most others. So this is, I think we'll start to see more experiences aiding into rather than trying to push content based on how close you are to something. But there's challenges with beacons. And you know you probably heard of some of them. But obviously, most of them, I wouldn't say all of them, most of them run on some sort of battery, whether it's a watch battery, whether it's a double A, whether whatever. But if you think about that, let's say I'm a huge enterprise organization. I want to ha I have 400 stores, and I need 1,000 of them per store. Imagine the management of that stuff, and your employees are going to manage that. So the management of that is going to be pretty crazy. So they're starting to create more and more beacons that power. You can just plug them in, obviously, a little smarter. But you still got to manage them. So there's a whole management process to that. But with any battery and any radio signal, it decreases over time. There's already a variance, because it's just a radio signal. Um, but it will decrease over time if you're using batteries. Obviously, like I said, support and maintenance, being able to now some have their own APIs you can utilize, Estimo does, and a lot of people do. Sometimes it's good, sometimes that's bad, sometimes it gets in the way of what you really want to do. You can use beacons right out of the box with no, most of them you can, without any SDK integration. Um, this is the big one. So we took two weeks. We actually built the, the application, and we, we blocked out two weeks just for the testing of variants inside of the actual physical location of the UICA. You, have you ever been in it? It's a giant cement building. So, and they have Wi-Fi in there. So thankfully, they had Wi-Fi built into the building. Otherwise, it would have been a disaster. But they did have the Wi-Fi network inside of it. And once you hop on that Wi-Fi network, the content, it's all uh, cloud-based type of serving up content. It was no locally stored content. But to figure out the ranges of each beacon, um, we, the best way to do beacons is actually above um, most of the smartphones. The best way to get the best signal is actually on the front face of your phone. So if I have one on that wall over there, and I'm like this, looking at it, you're not getting the best signal because you're coming through here. Because obviously, you have cases. You have all this crazy stuff happening here. So the best way is to do it there. So the higher you can mount them to the ceiling, the better signal strength you're going to get. But you do have the, we, this was the two weeks worth. We had a lot of overlap. So you can change all the sensors based on their meter range inside of the phone. So if I'm standing here, I know the meter range is X versus that one over there. So there's a lot of overlap because they're all just, obviously, it's a radio signal, right? So it's circular or um, you know, it, it encompasses other signal ranges. So the interference was a big challenge. And even people, so if we had a bunch of people, so if we did have the beacon on this wall here, and we had a bunch of people standing between me and that beacon, it would block that interference because us as humans are interference as well. So interference is a big one. So if you ever do a beacon project, allow a, a big gap of time to work on your variances because it may work awesome in here. You go take it to your client, it's not going to work for shit. So just warn you there. <laughs> um, as I said, large variances of signals. So a lot of the beacons that we tested, um, what will happen is it's just like a, a radio wave. So as I stand here, I may get five feet, I may get six feet, I may get eight feet, I may get six feet. So you have to write in a variance algorithm to kind of balance that out over a period of time to make sure you're within a certain range. Um, most of them have those already built in. You can write your own and customize it for what you need to do. 
Uh, and then you're going to get a delayed response. So beacons work when the phone is totally off. So I have the app installed. I could walk around, and I could be pushed information without even having the app on or my phone on. The challenge is, is based on the refresh cycle of the phone, depending on where it is in its cycle, it's going it, to, my phone could take, you know, four minutes to pick it up. Someone else's phone could take a second. So it, there's always that variance depending on where that phone is in its refresh cycle when it's off. You may not know exactly when it's, so the, it's not an instant response. Everyone's like, oh, beacons are great. Instantly get that. No, it doesn't quite happen instantly. There's always a variance of people getting that information at a certain times. And then obviously Bluetooth's a big one. <coughs> Got to have an, a, a smartphone that has active Bluetooth either turned on or actually has Bluetooth. Now there are some, uh, which I just found out, there's a, a company called Signal360. They make a Bluetooth beacon, but they also have an audio version, so they combine the two together. So let's say I have a smartphone that doesn't have Bluetooth. They actually use audio frequency to actually trigger notifications. So think like Shazam, but it's always on. I don't have to go and launch the app and stuff. So it works just like a, a, a Bluetooth beacon, but it works with sound. So the, think about it from a sporting event, horn goes off because you scored a goal, now everybody can have that experience because it, it just happened, right? So there's a, some interesting things you can do with sound um, that I you know, previously didn't think you could do, but there's actually some really interesting things. So Signal 360, I actually do the University of Michigan um, and a couple other stadiums that are into sports, so it's a pretty interesting read that you guys should check out. So sensing, um, so sensing in the sense that design sensing, not as a sensor sensing something. Um, how I define it, it's, it's, it's basically the, the collection of large data sets in real time to predictively serve up the best intended experience. So like we talked about earlier, that just right experience, collecting all that data and doing that huge analytics on that information and serving up that data. Great examples, you know, obviously the Nest thermostat and its network of platform uh, of, of, of what it combines with the smoke detectors, you know, now they're starting to have the August lock here is basically you put it on your door and you can unlock your, your house using your phone. Um, the drop cam they purchased. And then there are integrations with Mercedes-Benz and being able to turn on your home, turn it up, turn it down based on how far you're away. <clears throat> as well as other types of, so this is an alarm clock, Aurora alarm clock, weird looking, but it's, it's a light. Somehow the lights make you wake up better or something. I don't know how it works, but it's an ambient light. Uh, alarm clock tied in with Nest thermostat and smoke detector and field two light bulbs. And then there's also Whirlpool, I think, is another partner. So they take all this information, all these partners that are part of it that aren't really Nest, get to leverage that information as well. So now, if I'm Whirlpool, I know what you're doing with the Nest thermostat. So there's this great trade in the data that's happening. So now, I'm not sure what they would do that, but now they can serve up something some sort of experience or product to them that they would want without them even knowing it because they're looking at this other information. So I think we're starting to see that huge sensing platform evolve even more as people open up their APIs. Another great example, example is Uber partnering with more and more hotels to know both pieces of information. So the Star if anybody's a Starwood um, preferred guest, they use Starwood hotels, you can actually hook up your account to Uber and now Uber knows when you book hotels and Starwood knows when you take an Uber. So they can cross-reference each other and serve up, you know, maybe, I'm not going to say they're going to serve ads, but they're going to serve up an experience that may benefit you more than not. So now they can start leveraging that information. So I think we're going to have this weird you know, dynamic of all these different types of sensors information starting to boil out. And obviously, once Apple releases all their health information you can tap into, that'll be great. It's just when will they do it? Who knows? Um, but I think we'll be able to leverage a lot of those great experiences. So I just got a couple examples and I'll wrap up. Um, anybody here have kids age of like under, well, younger kids, I should say, like probably one and under, but, uh, or used to. You'll be, you'll be able to relate to this if you have kids in general. There's this thing called Sproutling, and it actually is a wearable device for baby. You put it around their leg, and it basically detects. I don't know if anybody's seen this, and I don't want to, hopefully you have nobody has good. Um, and it has an app that will tell you, based on, the movement as well as the heart rate and how long they slept. It does an algorithm and says, oh, the baby's going to wake up really pissed off or the baby's going to wake up really happy. So, um, but it's really fascinating. They, they created this great video. So I'm going to play this video and it's, 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 it's hilarious. This is you. This is your baby. 
You are a fully formed, even dare we say, skilled human being. Your baby isn't. You've matched belts with shoes, gotten to work on time at least 83% of the time, and emerged from the human mating ritual with someone you actually love. To be honest, your baby hasn't really done anything that impressive. Yet. So, why are you so afraid of your baby? Look, you've got this. Sure, sleep is like maybe not ever happening again. You're wiping things you never thought you'd wipe off another human being. And it's not exactly like your love life is firing in all cylinders these days. Maybe all you need is a little help. This is a job you not only can do, but can own with the help of the Sproutling Baby Monitor. It works with your phone. So say your baby is sleeping and you just want to know if his tiny little heart is beating. It's perfectly normal, you're a parent. Well, we can help with that. Or you'd like to know if he's happy or cranky when he gets up. You got it. Maybe you're doing something <laughs> insane, like socializing, and you just want to know if it's getting a little loud in the baby's room. It can actually do that. Or you'd like to have an idea of when he's going to wake up, so you can say, get reacquainted with a person you used to know before all this. Yep, done. You can even charge it on 0.0, .0 hours of sleep. These are just little things, but they can help you a ton. Be confident. Be strong. Be a life-living, sleep-having, baby-raising badass. So yeah, their charger is a wireless conductive charger and this speaker sound, so that's how they can detect if there's loud sounds there. So, the baby wearable mark is going to grow, obviously, but that, that, that was probably the best one I've seen thus far. I have yet to train, train that one, but it's definitely interesting. This one I'm not going to show all of. Any question? Did you have any questions? Um, so Google Glass, this was a, a manufacturing warehouse example. Um, they did a bunch of uh, testing with it, limited, but um, you can kind of see how this could scale exponentially with the, if anybody's familiar with the pick and pack kind of assembly in a manufacturing or assembly plant. Grab the right thing, put it in the right box, move on, pace, and all that fun stuff. They actually, you know, increased speed, which is a challenge for some, because um, you want pace. But, uh, but in, the big thing is they improved, you know, the air, reduced the air rates was the big thing. And they did a little video, not quite, um, you know, pointing on what Google Glass can do. It isn't a VR, some of the VR stuff in there, but you get the idea. I won't play all of it because it's really pretty long, but. Uh, they kind of overlay these things inside of a warehouse. They actually overlay directions and a lot of different types. But there's one part in here for support and maintenance when they, um, when they get to the point of actually having a problem with one of these machines, Welcome. you can have an overlay of a help or assistant tell you where to put things to actually change. So you can think about you know, auto mechanics at home could become a very interesting. Incoming pick request. For customer 351, 22 items, please confirm. Confirmed. So again, hands-free, using audio to confirm pickups and deliveries, telling where to go. Show item one. The size for item one is 30 by 25 by 5, and the weight of 0.5 kilogram. It's not so this is a little, little bit of marketing here. Can't quite do that with Google Glass. Holo lens, maybe, if it wasn't so small in the middle right at this point, but... But I think we'll get to this point of, as we see, you know, improvements inside of, you know, Google Glass or HoloLens or different types of uh, AR. Um, I think it will serve a pretty big part inside the business. I do have a whole safety part in here, so you're not running into each other. It's, it's, they did a good job of uh, kind of explaining. Pick three. So the biggest challenge is with picking and packing is the accuracy. You want it to be 100%. So obviously you have, you have visual verification. Right now they use a combination of lights and, and different types of things to validate. So here they're using you know, visual verification.
Obviously the cost has to come down too. Obviously $1,500 per employee might be a little, a little much. So here's where the, I'll probably stop it after this, but he had a problem with the maintenance, um, or problem with the machine, so he has to go for maintenance. This part here I think is, is pretty interesting where I think how many people fix their own vehicles or want to fix something. This whole process I think could be a really something to, we could see. So he's actually overlaying where the things need to go and what needs to be read and he's doing a bunch of video voice. Just put both tubes together and you should be fine. What's that? No, it's, it, no, definitely not. No. Definitely not. This is over in the UK too, so I think they have, I have their own. But yeah, so that's kind of, it, it goes on for a little while. I can definitely send out the article if you guys want to see the rest of it. Um, but it's definitely interesting how they started to build in the whole business side of it to verify with, uh, with VR, or I'm sorry, AR. So some of the takeaways from the presentation, um, obviously year of the experience, um, ask those questions versus you know that mobile first strategy, ask that context first strategy idea. Again, think about how you can strip away as much as you can versus add as much as you can from a feature. You know, challenge some of your teammates to do that on particular projects. Um, and again, if people say, hey, they're not gonna you know, do that technology or use that technology, well, if it serves a value and time to satisfaction, they'll actually use that technology if it gives them something in value. Um, before they want it. Um, and then again, based on that BMW example, make sure you think about all those steps beyond just your interface on your phone or on your application. Think about the context by which they have to interact with it. So that 13 steps really should only be two. Uh, again, focus on time to satisfaction for the customer, whether that's a great thing that's happened or is that customer service because they had a bad experience, what is the time to satisfaction to fix that? So there's two ways to look at that time to satisfaction. And again, a great employee experience ultimately means a great customer experience. Um, and then the whole idea of you know, predictively serving up that great experience is, is involved with all of that analytical um, real-time assessment and, and providing that just-in-time um, Goldilocks experience. So that's it that I have for you today.